Hello and welcome to the National D-Day Memorial, at least virtually. I'm John Long, the Director of Education here at the Memorial. And uh, if you have been with us in our book club before online, you know April Cheek Messier, my colleague, is normally with us. She's not with us today. Uh, we have a slightly different format in the past. It's been April and myself discussing a book that, uh, uh, that we have read uh, for today about well, a little, few weeks ago. I realized I had uh, been in communication with uh, three different regional authors who written books about World War II and who better to describe a, a book than the author. And so we decided rather than uh, April and myself discussing the books as readers, we would ask three authors to come in and discuss their projects. Um, and we will get to our authors in just a minute. But let me uh, first invite you back tomorrow at noon uh, for our next uh, World War Wednesday program, which features longtime friend of the National D-Day Memorial, Flo Plana uh, from France, who will be speaking on Frank Paragory, a Virginia boy who is a uh, was a Medal of Honor recipient from the 29th Division. Absolutely fascinating story of his background and his heroism that led to the Medal of Honor designation for the uh, 29th Division. And uh, Flo, uh, who is married to former employee here at the Memorial, Jenny, uh, they will be with us tomorrow. The, uh, the lecture part will be pre-recorded just to make sure that the internet crossing the ocean doesn't uh, interrupt us. Uh, but then Flo will be here to answer questions and uh, we invite you to, uh, to join us for that and then look out for our other World War Wednesday programs coming for the rest of the summer, uh, including in August, a visit with John McManus, uh, the historian of uh, the United States Army and Craig Simons, a real well-known historian of the United States Navy. And so uh, I'm looking forward to those. Uh, but today we have three authors joining us virtually uh, to talk about their, their uh, works in turn. And uh, I'll just say their names now, give you a little more of an in-depth introduction as we get to each to talk about their uh, their works and their projects. So uh, uh, K.L. Jayberg, Kathy Jayberg, a uh, good friend of the memorial, Robin Freywick Williams, a new friend of the memorial, and then Sally Jamison Bond, a uh, neighbor of mine in Salem. Um, and we're going to talk to each one in turn. I'm going to begin with you, Sally, if you don't mind. Uh, Sally sure. Jamison Bond was born and raised in Iowa, the daughter of a World War II and a Korean War veteran, uh, and an artistic mother who loved to write. Uh, so it's in the genes, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> she holds a music performance degree from the University of Iowa and worked in academic libraries for 30 years before we, she retired in 2017. Sally lives in Southwest Virginia with her husband and two dogs. And her first novel, My Mother's Friend, is not out yet, but coming. And so welcome, <laughs> Sally. And uh, let's begin by just telling us, uh, you know, what drove you to this project? And uh, the theme, of course, of all three of these books uh, is World War II. So why why World War II? Why, why, did, why is that a story you wanted to tell? Right. Yeah, uh, it's a great question, isn't it? Um, first of all, thank you, John, for having me. Uh, it's a huge honor, um, a dream come true, actually. So um, thank you so very much for having me on today. <clears throat> so I've been thinking about this a little bit, of course, before um, today. And um, I think there are um, two things that inspired me to write My Mother's Friend. And the first thing that inspired me is this um, statement I believe the stories of World War II still deserve our attention. Um, I think now more than ever, um, the, the more years that pass, the more important that it is that we have documentation, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, um, about what happened during that extraordinary per period of time um, in the history of the world, really, obviously. So that was one inspiration that I had. Um, my other inspiration um, was my husband, Joe, believe it or not. And um, let me explain briefly how that happened. Um, 
In early 2015, it was a Saturday morning, Joe and I were standing in our kitchen having a discussion about the World War II movie or documentary we had watched the night before, and um, a question popped into my head. So I posed the question to Joe. I said, so where did they put all those German POWs during the war? And Joe's reply was, well, there were several POW camps in Iowa. In fact, there was one in Algona. Uh, as soon as he said that, I thought to myself, Sally, you should write a book about that. <laughs> That's exactly how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so then the next thing I knew, uh, thought of right away, I didn't say anything right away to Joe about it, um, but I thought to myself, um, Okay, I'm going to write a book, and it's going to involve Camp Algona, the POW camp that was outside of um, the town, small town of uh, Algona in northern Iowa. It would be a love story. I knew that. And the third thing I knew about it was that I was going to name my um, teenage protagonist after my mom. My mom's name was Phyllis, and she, um, everybody that knew her called her Fee, P-H-E-E. -E. And so my protagonist's name is Fee Swenson. So I knew that for sure. Um, so I didn't say anything to anybody about this for quite some time because um, I'd never had an idea that I should write a book before. So it was, it was very odd, obviously, for me to come up with this idea. And I didn't want to say anything to anybody in case I changed my mind. Um, but I didn't change my mind. The more I thought about it, the more I liked the idea. Um, I start, started thinking about all the characters I wanted to involve and the story and where it would go. And eventually, um, a few months later, I think it was, I started telling people about it. Um, and of course, once you tell people about um, that you're going to write a novel, you really do have to write it. So, <laughs> um, so I, I did. Um, and um, I was coming up to retirement actually um, at the end of 2017. So I had some time um, to do some uh, pretty heavy research. Um, I knew I needed to do research. I knew absolutely nothing about prisoner of war camps in America. I was stunned when I learned that they were here. How could I not know that? I thought I knew a lot about World War II, but I didn't know that detail. And um, that's one of my goals, actually, for writing this book, is to educate my readers about prisoner of war camps during the war. So I spent a lot of time um, at, um, I went to the um, National Archives up in College Park, Maryland, spent a day and a half there looking at documents um, that came from Camp Algona. <clears throat> I spent some time at the Smithsonian looking at their um, World War II artifacts and exhibits. I made a, a research road trip to Iowa, um, visiting the State Historical Society Research Centers in Iowa City and Des Moines, and um, went to Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois. And um, in 2016, um, I was fortunate enough to spend uh, two times. I went to um, Algona twice. Um, my first visits to Algo, I had never been there before. It's in the opposite side of the state from Otumwa, where I'm from. And um, so I, I got to Algona and, and did uh, quite a bit of research there, met some absolutely fabulous people there. And I think probably the most rewarding thing about this whole process has been uh, meeting some absolutely fabulous people. Um, I tell people about my story and everybody smiles. They just think it's the best idea. And um, when I'm doing research and I'm meeting people uh, who are helping me, um, it's just been, it's, it's been so rewarding. I have to say, I just, um, I'm so grateful that I've had this opportunity that I came up with this idea and that on that February morning in 2015, um, it has changed my life totally. I mean, it absolutely, totally changed my life um, for the good, absolutely. Um, I actually got to interview some people in Algona who were alive during World War II in Algona or near Algona, and that was very rewarding and very helpful. Um, there's a fabulous um, 
um, put a plug in for the um, Camp Algona POW Museum in Algona. Um, it's a wonder, wonderful museum. Um, highly recommend that to everyone who is uh, interested in learning more about um, the subject. Um, please do make an effort to get there. Um, it's great. So, um, so I did retire at the end of 2017 and a month later I started to write. And I wrote full time, pretty much, um, for about a year and a half, actually. And I finally finished my first draft. And I didn't, um, I didn't track the wordage, word, word counts as I was writing. I just wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. Um, the book pretty much wrote itself, actually. Um, I don't know if I should admit that, but it's true. It really did. And um, so about a year and a half after I began, I uh, finished and I decided, oh, I should probably count these words. So they were all on a bunch of Word documents. So I had to figure all that out. And I had uh, written almost a little over 280,000 words, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is enough for three novels. Um, and I didn't want to make this a trilogy, so um, I spent the next, um, well, up until now, actually, looking for ways to uh, make it leaner, and I've done a pretty good job. I'm now down to just around 105,000, <laughs> which is really a pretty good length, I think, for a historical novel. Um, I'm, I'm very satisfied with it. I'm still, um, I'm making one last pass through it now. Um, a year ago, I had six beta readers read my story, and they gave me um, incredibly helpful feedback. I was able to incorporate a lot of their suggestions into the story, made it better, absolutely made it better. And um, I did have my editor look at it last November. Um, she's going to get to look at it again <laughs> in about a month, I think, um, when I finally finish the last pass. And then I'm going to put it to bed, and then I'm going to look for a publisher. So. That's um, that was my journey. Has been my journey. Um, it's been really fun. I've loved it very much. Um, before I finish, I want to um, segue over to social media, if I can. Um, I I actually launched my um, author webpage in March of this year. It's a really good webpage. I love it and. I started blogging then. I didn't know I was going to be a blogger, but I am a blogger now. <laughs> and I highly recommend everybody going to my um, my webpage and finding my blogs. And I don't know if um, you're going to have that web address. It's www.sallyjamisonbond.com. Um, and um, you can find my blogs there. And I highly recommend that you do and sign up for updates. and. Um, all of my blogs um, center around something about World War II. So you're going to learn a lot and you're going to uh, know a lot before you read my book about uh, the things that are important in my book. So um, I highly recommend that. So I avoided um, joining social media because I was afraid it would be a time suck and it kind of is, but um, I also understood uh, thanks to um, someone that's, very near and dear to me, Tom, that I should be on Facebook. So um, at the end of April, I joined Facebook and um, Instagram too. I guess they go hand in hand. Um, and so um, I've been um, enjoying it for the most part, I, more so than I thought I would actually. Um, but I needed to find a lot of followers, right? You're an author, you want people to know about your book, so you want you want people out there who um, know about you and about your book. <clears throat> so of course, the, my first group of followers or friends that I asked were people I know. So, you know, I know a lot of people because I'm kind of old and I've been around and <laughs> I know, I know a lot of people, but I don't know enough, um, obviously, personally. So the next group of people that I focused on um, to ask to invite to be my friend were Lutherans, believe it or not. No kidding. Um, my protagonist's father is a Lutheran pastor, and um, 
So the family lives in the parsonage next to the church, next next to St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Algona. And um, so I knew I, that, uh, that Lutherans would be very interested in my story. You don't have to be a Lutheran to enjoy it, but if you are, then you're definitely going to enjoy my story. Um, my next group of uh, folks that I focused on were um, musicians, actually. Um, music plays a a critical role in my story. It's almost like a, a character. Um, my protagonist, Fee Swenson, and the POW, her German friend that she um, becomes more than friends with eventually. Um, they're both very talented musicians, pianists. Um, and um, so music plays a huge role. I focused on trumpet players because my protagonist's Fee's um, older brother, Jamie, is a trumpet player in the United States Army Band. Um, and I, um, I've also invited a lot of trombonists because my husband, Joe and I are both trombonists. So of course I wanted to invite all those nice people because they are wonderful. All trombonists are wonderful people. Um, and then I focused on people who either live in or are from Iowa because my story takes place in Algona, Iowa. <clears throat> and um, I focused on um, people in my hometown of Ottumwa, and I focused on um, people from Fort Dodge, which is Joe's hometown. Um, I look for people in Iowa City. Um, we're both Iowa alums. Go Hawks. Mm -hmm. And um, anybody from Iowa is fine, or the upper Midwest, or not. <laughs> And of course, the, the last group of people that I've been focused on um, asking to be my friends on Facebook are um, people that I think would like historical fiction. Now, how would I know that? <laughs> of course, I don't. But you can kind of look at people's faces and you can say, I think she likes historical fiction. I, I mean, I, I really did do that <laughs> when I was going all those going through all those Facebook suggestions. If I if nothing else was was familiar, then I'd say, I think that person might like um, historical fiction. Um, and if he or she doesn't, then maybe they know someone who does. So um, the only thing that I'm not um, happy with yet is that I haven't been able to look find en enough friends from Algona to be my Facebook friend. So if you're watching this and you know anybody who, live in, who lives in Algona and wants to be my friend, please ask them to invite me. Um, send me a request. I'd really appreciate that. So, and Sally, um, uh, I I am looking forward to your book coming out because the prisoner of war system in the United States has has fascinated me for years. Uh, it's very big in Virginia, for instance, right. not just Iowa, all over the nation. Uh, and to me, it's one of the great not only untold stories but one of the great success stories. It is of the war that helped Absolutely. to really mend fences afterwards. A lot of the Germans went home with very fond memories of the United States. I think you're they sure did. Gonna yeah. touch with that. That's so right. We'll come back to you with some questions in a little bit. We'll sure. move on now to uh, Robin. Robin Trawick Williams is an award-winning journalist, author, and storyteller, a baby boomer who grew up in Lynchburg, right up the road from us, uh, listening to her parents talk about life during World War II. The story of her, her parents' exotic global courtship inspired her to write her latest book, The Last Romantic War. Robin holds a master's degree from the creative writing program at Hollins University, spent five years as a feature writer at the Richmond Times Dispatch, is the author of three other books, including two collections of humorous essays and a novel set at a racetrack. And Robin, your book is uh, different than the other two in that you have uh, more in the nonfiction realm. So tell us about The Last Romantic War. Thank you, John. Um, it, it really is such an honor to be part of this program from the D-Day Memorial. And um, before I begin, let me express my thanks and appreciation to all the veterans and veterans families out there for their service to America. We're so lucky to live here and, we, and we're blessed to have so many wonderful people who've given their time, their talents, their health and, and sometimes their lives that we can continue to live in the greatest, freest country that has ever existed. This is a great country and the American people are the most generous, open-hearted people on earth. And we should never doubt that. Um, 
even though some of that goodness is being questioned today by some people, that was certainly not the case in the 1940s when millions of Americans went all over the world to fight the scourge of fascism, socialism, and Marxism. We're talking about what Tom Brokaw named the greatest generation. My book takes a look at the lives of two members of that generation and their families and the sacrifices they made that the civilized world might remain free. The last romantic war covers the drama of World War II and the drama and romance of my parents' exotic courtship during the war. They met on a blind date shortly after Pearl Harbor. My dad proposed that very night and my mother accepted, but they were a long way from the altar. After whirlwind courtship, they had a misunderstanding and dad went to Burma for two and a half years. Mom went to work in the war effort and fell in love with a spy, one of ours. Flo <laughs> <laughs> and Bo fell in love at the beginning of the war, then went their separate ways for the duration. But in the end, wild horses, burning airplanes, and mixed up train schedules could not keep them apart. The book grew out of my love of adventure stories and listening to my dad's stories about being in the jungle in World War II. He served under General Stilwell in the CBI, the China, Burma, India theater of war. The CBI is the forgotten theater. But as I was to discover in my research, it was a vast adventure. And for someone like me who was weaned on Tarzan, the Black Stallion, Jack London. The true life adventure of the Burma campaign was intoxicating. Burma was a British colony, as I'm sure everybody knows. And the Burma campaign was fought not by American soldiers, but by 30,000 Chinese troops and a million and a half troops from around the United Kingdom with only a few American special ops units. My father was one of only a few dozen American officers who trained Chinese troops in India and then went into Burma as liaisons and advisors with the Chinese units. His was not the band of brothers war experience. He lived among Chinese officers, learned to speak Chinese, ate rice with chopsticks three times a day. He had a very exotic experience. He rode elephants and camels, ate python meat, socialized with native royalty, and received as gifts a pouch full of jade and two samurai swords. He carried a plug of opium around to barter with the natives. He suffered malaria, survived a hand grenade, hacked his way through bamboo and elephant grass, you know, it was war. He dodged death on numerous occasions. But the more I listened to dad's stories, the more I thought the grandchildren have to hear about this. But when I proposed writing a book about mom and dad's experiences in the war, they dismissed the idea out of hand. Dad said, I didn't do anything heroic. And mom said, oh, everybody got married that way. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but everybody didn't get married that way. And and even without conspicuous heroism, service in Burma was uh, exotic, dangerous, um, and fascinating. So I recorded 30 hours of my father telling war stories. And I spent two years doing research on the war, the Burma campaign. Like Sally, I went to the National Archives. Uh, I went overseas to many of the places where dad traveled during the war, India, Burma, Australia, New Zealand, the Middle East. You know, I wanted to see where he went and what it felt like. My dad was a storyteller. He was always telling anecdotes and stories about his life, often with self-deprecating humor. But far and away, his favorite story was how he met and married my mother. He would start out, you know, we met on April Fool's Day. 
<laughs> as though we hadn't heard that a hundred times. <laughs> and he would launch into the account of meeting her on a blind date and how they agreed that night to get married. He always told the story as though he were seeing her again, sashaying across the parking lot at the officer's club at Fort Benning. It was the beginning of a love story that he savored for more than 60 years, and he often told it with a touch of wonder that the story ended the same way every time. The hero gets the girl. <laughs> But while I set out to document Dad's adventures in Burma, the book evolved, as books do, and became the story that he loved to tell, the story of a great love affair, writ large against the vast backdrop of a global war. While Dad shared his stories with me verbally, Mom contributed her diaries, her scrapbooks, her memories to my research. And as I explored life on the home front, I found myself just as fascinated as I was with life in the jungle. You know, World War II ushered in a period of great social change, as wars often do. For starters, the mobilization effort pulled the country out of the Depression at last. We built 325,000 airplanes, 88,000 tanks, 1,400 warships, and of course, millions of rounds of ammunition. That'll pump up your economy. Then you had 12 million men in uniform, which meant that a big portion of that generation traveled all over the world. You know, today everybody is a globe trotter, especially the young people, but, but in the 30s, no one ever expected to travel abroad. People hardly traveled out of state. Well, that, that was a big deal. Another big change was integration of the armed forces, which grew out of the war effort and took place in the years immediately following the war. And finally, although no one suspected it at the time, asking women to take the jobs of the men who were going overseas led to a permanent change in social attitudes. And my mother was one of those who benefited from this change. Um, in attitudes about working women. It was important for me to try to capture the feel of wartime in this book, and I asked Mom a lot of questions about that. In her memories of the war, two things stand out about the mood of the country. One, the unity of purpose, and two, the uncertainty about what tomorrow would bring. Mom said, Everywhere you went, you could sense that people felt we are all in this together and, and they would help each other in spontaneous ways. But there was also the pervasive cloud of fear hanging over the country. When will this be over? Who will be taken next? And the big question, will we win? We know how the war came out now, but they didn't know in the early years what would happen. And that was an important feel I wanted to capture in the book. America was shockingly unprepared to fight a global war. When World War I ended 20 years earlier, America disarmed. My father, who was in the class of 39 at Clemson, spoke of drilling troops armed with wooden rifles. Just sticks, not real rifles. In the big war games held in Louisiana in 1941, Dad said the Army hired men in private airplanes, you know, like little Piper Cubs, to fly over and throw bags of flour out the window to simulate bombs. My mother told me there was so much uncertainty. The mantra was, live for the day, live for the moment. She said every day was filled with raw emotion. People's emotions were just very close to the surface all the time. So on the home front, um, the coping mechanisms included going to the movies, which were full of escapist glamour and romance. You know, go back and look at those movies from the 40s. Um, and they're always sort of a Cinderella story, but the the 
poor destitute girl who can't pay her rent somehow has a magnificent wardrobe. So people went to the boobies for escapism and they danced to the big band music. Dancing was the rage, swing dancing. And, you know, the big bands played everywhere from road houses to hotel ballrooms, sometimes four or five nights a week. It also became a patriotic duty for my mother and her generation to write letters to men overseas. Remember, no Facebook, no email, no cell phones. My mom corresponded with at least a dozen men, including eventually my father. But imagine how challenging it must have been for my dad and soldiers everywhere to conduct a courtship when it often took a letter three weeks to be delivered and three more weeks for the answer. Do you still love me? This book is a memoir of a relationship that unfolded at a certain time in history. It is also a look at the era, what it was like to live through World War II if you were a young American. After all, Flo and Bo's love story cannot be separated from the great global conflict they shared. Their courtship would not have unfolded as it did had they not met at the precise moment of America's entrance into the war. Six months earlier, a couple of years later, their story would not be worth telling. But today, with so much conflict in the world and so much division in the country, stories like this and others from the World War II era are very much worth telling. We cannot afford to let the example of American courage achievement and unity in the war years be forgotten or washed away as other parts of American history take on more prominence. The last romantic war is more than the love story of one couple. It is a snapshot of one of America's finest hours. I started out to write this book for the grandchildren, but I have been so pleased to have former history teachers tell me it should be required reading in every high school. Mm. Keep the memories alive. Great. Thank you, Robin. Excellent. And uh, you and I should join a club because my parents met on a blind date right at the end of World War II uh, as well. So, yeah. uh, well, it, it was not an uncommon thing. That's why my mother said, oh, everybody got married that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was a time of so much uncertainty uh, that, you know, you often didn't do things the way your parents would have or the way your children will later on. So yeah. thank you. We'll go back to some questions for Robin in a bit, but we'll move on now to Kathy uh, Jaber, K.L. Jaber, a retired pediatric nurse. Her love of history has led her to become a living historian to train a World War II Navy wave code breaker. She's a docent right here at the National D-Day Memorial and volunteer guardian for the Central Memorial, or excuse me, Central and Southwest Honor Flight. Uh, her hobbies include playing uh, double second Jamaican steel drums, and I've heard her do it. It's really, uh, really fascinating music, and performing in charity concerts with a local steel drum band. With her husband at her side, they hike the Blue Ridge Mountains and travel to historical sites around the world. They have two children, Stephen and Katie, and uh, by now, three books in her home front series. So Kathy, tell us what inspired you and why should people be reading your books? Thank you for having me. Um, I am surrounded by these World War II heroes and now their families are the oral historians that are telling us about them. Uh, we greet them daily up at the D-Day Memorial, also international visitors and their stories. Also, as our readers and our viewers are aware of, per capita, Bedford lost the most young men on D-Day, uh, sombering. They were part of the 116th Infantry Regiment, 29th Division. And I can say that there was two women that finally motivated me to sit down and write. The first woman is a dear friend of mine. Her name is Marguerite. Reynolds Cottrell. She is the youngest sibling of 
private first class John Reynolds, one of those Bedford boys. Everybody called him Little Jack. He was never called John. He was the communication runner for Company A, and he gave the ultimate sacrifice on that first wave in on Bloody Omaha Beach. Hearing her stories, she was five years old when she lost her brother. Very vivid in her mind uh, to hear her stories and to understand and be a little bit of what it was like to be put in that time and that place is you cannot help but be in awe. I also have to say that you might notice a Navy wave over my shoulder. This is Ruth Rather Vaden. She was a World War II Navy wave stationed in Washington, D.C. She is one of those code girls, code breakers. She broke the encrypted codes of the Germans, and the secret was kept from her family for years. She had to. She was required to do that. Meeting her daughter and her daughter telling me about her mother, you cannot help but be inspired. So my books, there are a series called the Homefront Series. I'm going to take you on this journey. It opens up in Bedford in July of 1944, almost six weeks after D-Day. And I put you in the shoes of the people in this town. They're waiting for word. They don't want those dreaded telegrams, but yet they're waiting for word. And they start arriving. Now, you may see towns get one or two telegrams a day. It is raining telegrams on Bedford. You're getting telegrams that say missing in action, wounded in action, killed in ac action, 6th of June. So Lisbeth is my main protagonist in the story. She's a young girl growing up here. Her family is also worried. They have a loved one serving in the Pacific Theater and Lisbeth's older sister is the Navy Wave. This young girl is gonna take you on this journey, much like what Marguerite took me on the journey. That rationing, that doing without, that community pulling together in unbelievable grief. Moving on, life had to go on. The uncertainties of war, raising families, working towards the war effort, that's what my books capture. That's what I try to take my reader into. My second book is Footlockers of War. We continue with Elizabeth as her family grows and changes with the times. Two footlockers that was lost to the family is now returned. They're rusted, they're sealed together. And Elizabeth wants to open them. She wants to learn more about her loved ones that serve. And surprisingly, she gets resistance. And the story evolves around much of what my veterans and their families tell me today. Many of our veterans put the footlockers away, tried to put the war behind them and moved on. Some would talk about it to their families, but sadly some of our veterans simply could not. And to open these footlockers, this is gonna open old wounds. And Elizabeth and her family have to work through this. In all my books, I point back to Bedford. I point back to sacrifice, but I also point to the women of World War II and their contribution. It was unheard of for a single girl to leave home and go states away or over the world. I mean, that was just unheard of. Um, the things that our parents did at home to win this war. When Europe surrendered, Many people told me they anticipated six or seven more years of war in the Pacific. So that uncertainty, that valor, that fidelity, that sacrifice we so often talk about is what I try to portray in all my books. The third book is Snapshots of Courage. I continue to point back to World War II. I continue to point back to Bedford, but I'm pointing forward. We're now in the Vietnam era. As Robin talked about, that unity that the United States felt during World War II, now we're not feeling that during the Vietnam War. And these old snapshots that the family finds shoved in drawers and old scrapbooks and shoe boxes, the younger family now has questions. And questions are pertinent to what their family's experiencing today in Vietnam. 
My goal in writing these books is always, always to honor a veteran and their family, especially our gold star family. I'm also thrilled that my readers tell me that I'm educating them. I'm also thrilled that they've fallen in love with my characters. It's surprising the comments I get and how real these fictitious characters are. I'm thrilled that I'm able to educate. I'm thrilled that I'm able to point to the valor, to the sacrifice of our veterans and their family. Um, Elizabeth is quite a character. She is partially Marguerite, with Marguerite's permission. She also has that personality of my daughter. Many of my characters in my book, I have based them on the veterans and their families that have shared their wonderful <coughs> stories, stories you would never get out of a history book. But when I go deeper into my research, the National Archives, the World War II Museum, and of course, my D-Day Memorial and John Long, there are stories that they tell me that are very personal. I'm able to go into history and learn that much more about the event. And I try to convey that in my book to my readers so that they too can become fascinated with World War II. And Sally, when you talk about the POWs in my first book, I talk about the POWs and how uh, Elizabeth's family had them working on their farm. Oh, we nice. had W's in Roanoke. Wonderful. And, that's great. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm thrilled that you're focusing on that too. Uh, you, several people responded that they couldn't possibly treated the POWs that way here. Uh, it couldn't possibly have occurred, yet we have documentation from letters and other things that said, oh yes, uh, we should be very proud of America and how we did not do what the Axis powers did, how yes, we did show the good side of America. Yes, we did. The, the America that we fought, that our veterans fought for. Yeah. So um, my fourth book will be coming out in November. It's called Christmases of Sacrifice. And um, it will highlight many of the characters in the first three books, but it does stand independently. So if someone strictly reads that book, they will understand what's going on with the book. Excellent. Thank you, Kathy. Robin, I'm sorry I knocked your book down there. I, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, appreciate you sharing, Kathy. And uh, we're going to take some questions now from, uh, uh, from people who are viewing in. Um, and if you have a question, we may not be able to get to all of them, but uh, depending on where you're watching, Facebook or YouTube, um, in the chat feature or the comment feature, uh, we can... Um, uh, take as many as we can, and some of them are addressed to a particular author, but I think uh, some of them be fun for any of you to uh, to uh, answer. So uh, uh, first one came in uh, from, uh, from Katie, who said, uh, uh, what has been one of the most impactful interactions you've had with veteran or veterans or someone who remembers the war? as you've been writing your books and uh, you have spoke, I think all three of you spoke of that to a point, but uh, can you each uh, just very quickly pull out one in particular veteran or someone, you know, firsthand account that you're able to, um, to get? Uh, I can talk on that briefly. I had a gentleman who was 11 years old the morning of the D-Day invasion. He was living in the Netherlands and he was listening to an illegal radio with his parents in the basement. They were picking up the BBC, announcing the invasion had started. And he looked at me and he said, that's why I've come to the D-Day Memorial. I will never forget. He said, if the Germans had caught us, they would have destroyed the radio and thrown my father in prison and much worse. He said, we do not forget. He said, if you're told that in Europe we were starving during the war, he said, all my family had to eat were the tulip bulbs. You can't help but be impacted by stories. Yeah. I give a, a lot of talks at retirement homes. And for me, the best part is talking to the people in the audience afterwards, listening to them. And they always come up and tell me their stories. 
Um, the most recent example, like, was similar to KL's story. Um, a man from the Netherlands said he was um, a, a little boy when the when the Germans came in and invaded oh. and. Um, he, he he started talking about it and then he broke down in tears. You know, this was 75 years ago and he's still, that memory is so powerful. Um, I, I think that's why all, the work that all of us are doing to keep, keep the memories and stories of that war alive is so important. Right. I, um, uh interesting that you both uh, mentioned the Netherlands because my blog that will be published tomorrow is about Anne Frank, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, so I, um, um, I invite everybody to find that one because it's, it's, it's a fascinating, most people know who Anne Frank is. Um, if you don't know, she was a um, young uh, Dutch girl in um, Amsterdam uh, when the, uh, when the Germans, invaded um, the Netherlands and she and her family had to go into hiding and they were discovered after two years and, and were sent to concentration camps. So um, anyway, so that's coming up tomorrow. <laughs> so please check it out. Um, I did have actually um, one uh, veteran story to talk about uh, real briefly. Um, when I was growing up in Ottumwa, we lived next door to the Darner family, and Brooks Darner was the father of my friend Roxy and um, and her brother David. And I didn't know when I was growing up that he was a veteran. You know, they just didn't talk about it. And so I assumed that a, a lot of my friends' um, fathers were probably veterans, and I just didn't know it. But I found out years later, and um, Brooks actually. Um, in his later years, got to do one of the honor flights um, to Washington. And I was asked to, um, by the organization, to write um, a letter to him that he could read on the flight. And I get really emotional when I talk about this because um, he was a wonderful man. And I actually um, was in Iowa and got to see him not too long before he passed away. And um, uh, had a wonderful conversation about him and, and told him how proud I was of him and, and thank him for his service and got to do that. It was just, it was fabulous actually. Um, so, and he, and he, he's been gone now for two or three years now, I think. So, you know, we're losing them so fast now. Um, it's so sad. Okay. Um, had a, a number of comments about uh, your, uh, your process. We can scroll down for me, Sarah, to the, at the bottom there. Um, and one uh, mentioned comment you made, Sally, about the book writing itself. But then uh, Maddie also uh, threw this in. I think it's a very interesting question for a writer of any genre. When you sit down in front of a blank page and begin to type, the story can go in a thousand different directions. How do you develop a plot line and answer the question, <laughs> what happens next? Oh, oh yeah. Is there an easy answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, writing historical uh, fiction, Christian fiction, uh, the history will kind of drive that general outline. Um, but yes. I truly feel that the combination of the people that you meet and a lot of prayerful consideration, at least for me on my part, before the pen hits the paper or the finger hits the keyboard, I truly question what am I, what is my purpose here with this story? And I can tell you the times that I've struggled the hardest are the times that I feel that I've been the most creative in my stories. Mm. And um, mm. I'm sure the other ladies agree that you hit those times where you're just trying to express something and, and the words are sort of coming, but you have to be harder at it. And um, so with historical fiction, very much, the history and the time frame of, say, the different events. Right. And then when you dive deeper into those details, you discover something about rationing or you discover something about uh, the Victory Gardens that will perfectly play into what you're writing. So mm -hmm. I'll let the other ladies respond. 
Yeah. And Robin, uh, yours is a true story. So yours is kind of guided by by the actual facts of the case. Right. But um, it was still very, you know, it was such a big story because I wanted to capture the feel of the war and not just tell my parents romance. Uh, so it was very hard to figure out how to tell that story. And I wrote three completely different drafts where I took a totally different approach to how to tell the story. And um, one draft was like Sally said about her book was, you know, huge and long. And I refer to that as the full family documentary version. That's this big. Um, <laughs> So uh, I went to a wonderful workshop at the um, Virginia Quarterly Review at, led by Megan Dom, who's a who's a wonderful writer. And she read, you know, the class read parts of that big draft and said, no, you need to tell this in your storyteller voice because that, I'm a storyteller. All my other writings, I, I have a voice where I just tell the story. And she said, you need to rewrite this book in, in that storyteller voice. Um, and so I went home and cried because it meant starting over again with a whole new draft. Um, but she was right and I sucked it up and did it. And, and <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, I figured out how to tell this, how to tell the story and what voice to use. Um, you know, is a big thing. And I, and I went back and listened to my dad's tapes. He was a storyteller and that helped a lot. Went, oh yeah. We just need to tell you that it just needs to be the favorite story that he always told. Great. That's great. Um, of course, um, as KL said, the writing about uh, the, the war, you have an automatic outline to follow if you want to, um, which I did um, to a certain degree, obviously, but um, but the writing process um, was unconventional, I think, um, my choices, because um, I, my very first chapter that I, that I wrote was the last chapter of the Algona part of my story, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, my, my book begins and ends in Berlin, Germany in 1991. I haven't mentioned that yet, but um, my protagonist's daughter, who is 30 something, she's a journalist and she flies to Berlin to interview um, an older uh, German gentleman who happens to be the chief conductor of the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. Um, and yes, he is the man that her mother had fallen in love with during the war. And um, so I wrote the last Algona chapter first, and then I wrote all the Berlin chapters. So the opening, chapters and the ending chapters. I wrote all those. Um, I thought they'd be easier to write because they um, were more contemporary. And I actually had been in Berlin in May of 1991 when that uh, part of the story takes place. So um, it was easier for me to visualize being there. Um, and then I returned to Algona and started um, in 1944. And um, I put myself in Algona and I wrote what I saw. I really did. Let me ask all three of you also, when you finish, how do you feel? Is it a sense of <laughs> triumph, relief, or is it a sense of, well, what am I supposed to do now? I've lived this book and yes. now it's finished. Yeah. <laughs> or all of them. <laughs> Yeah, I was very sad when I finished my racetrack novel because I had lived with those characters for so long and, you know, I love them and I sort of miss them and want to go back and see them. Um, the war book uh, was very important to me. My father did, he passed away in 2006 and he read a draft of the war sec, the, the Burma section and signed off on it, which, which was a huge relief. Um, and, uh, but my mother was still alive last year. She passed away in, just this past December and the book was in production. And, um, 
you know, I was so anxious. She read drafts of it, but I was very anxious for her to hold it in her hand. And it was extraordinarily gratifying to me and my brothers that she was, um, even though she was living in a stay in and out of the hospital in Richmond uh, at the time, she pretty much got up off her deathbed and went to Lynchburg on November 15th for the book launch and got to be the belle of the ball, you know, oh, that's one of the time with all her friends and um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that that was how I felt when I finished this book. Very very happy that my mom got to hold it in her hand. Absolutely. For me, the end of my first book, um, it was sad. Uh, you fall in love with your characters, but I can say the satisfaction of going and handing that book in Marguerite's hands mm -hmm. and um, mentioning her brother in her book. Uh, she does not want her brother, little Jack, forgotten. And she does everything she can to keep his memory, his sacrifice alive. And as I have handed the books to the other people who some of the characters are based on, um, it's that euphoria you feel after you've birthed a child, ladies. <laughs> it's that euphoria of knowing that, oh my God, all this labor, all these months, this is what has come of it. And the feedback from the people who I treasured their, their opinions and critiquing um, just makes me sit back down and say, now what am I going to write next? <laughs> well, I think we can all agree on a couple of things. One is that we will never exhaust all the stories of World War II. It's just yeah, too that's rich of background. Um, and I think we're all determined that what happened in those years and the people who fought it and experienced, uh, they, they won't be forgotten. We will, we will all work together to make sure that's, that's the case. Uh, well, we're about out of time, but I want to thank all three of you for joining us today for a fascinating author talk. Uh, so Kathy, Robin, Sally, we wish you well in your pursuits and we look forward to uh, your book coming out soon, Sally, and the, uh, the, the other two for your next books coming out. Uh, we hope you'll keep in touch. And uh, for those of you who've been watching, uh, the author's contacts have uh, it's been scrolling across the bottom of the screen. Uh, so you're welcome to check out their web pages, email them questions, and of course, look for their publications as well. Uh, so on behalf of the National D-Day Memorial, Sarah behind the uh, computer screen making it all happen, and uh, the, the uh, staff and uh, board and volunteers here at the Memorial, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. Uh, for our virtual program tomorrow and then the others in the future. So thanks and have a good afternoon. Thanks, Thank you, John. John. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>